Um, just wanted to start out with a quick show of hands. How many people here run Postgres in production on Kubernetes? Awesome. How many people run very large Postgres clusters in production? Very cool. And, and another show of hands. How many people think uh, Kubernetes is possible to run very large? Uh, great. Cool. Well, hopefully, uh, by the end of this talk, we can get more of those hands raised. And a uh, quick spoiler alert, um, we're going to show some ways to make it possible to actually restore very large Kubernetes uh, Postgres clusters 300 times faster than you can today. All right. So welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Michelle. I am a software engineer at Google. Um, I have been a Kubernetes maintainer since 2017, and I'm a SIG storage TL. I'm joined and here. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. I'm Gabriele, Gabriele Bartolini. I'm VP of Cloud Native at EDB. EDB is a company that um, contributes to the Postgres open source project. I've been using Postgres for more than 20 years, and uh, now I'm also a DOK data on Kubernetes ambassador. And... Uh, uh, an open source contributor. In the past, I, I created, um, I don't know if you're familiar with Barman. Anyone, does anyone know Barman for Postgres here? Okay. So I created Barman in 2011. It's a backup and restore manager for Postgres. And now I'm also a maintainer of Cloud Native PG, which is an operator for, uh, to run Postgres in Kubernetes. Thank you. Cool. Yeah, so we'll first start off with a uh, background in Postgres technologies on, on how P Postgres does backup and recovery. Um, we're going to talk about the new volume snapshot backup and recovery feature with the cloud native PG operator. Um, we're going to dive a little bit into details on the actual APIs and how you use it. Um, we're going to show a demo and then we will wrap that up afterwards. So in this first section, I will go through um, some important concepts behind disaster recovery with uh, Postgres databases. So disaster recovery is, together with high availability, one of the core components in IT to achieve business continuity. Planning a business continuity solution always starts with defining the goal to achieve as an organization. So once these goals are defined, we can shape our infrastructure and our system accordingly. But how do we define these business continuity goals? So over the past years, two primary metrics have emerged. The first one is RPO, or recovery point objective, which is the amount of time that we, uh, amount of uh, data that we can afford to lose uh, after a failure. And RPO is primarily a disaster recovery metric. The second one is RTO, or recovery time objective, which is the time needed to restore uh, a service after a failure. And the RTO is primarily a high availability metric. So it's only through uh, an exercise of risk management and cost efficiency that organizations find the right balance between these two opposing metrics. So one of the coolest aspects of Postgres is its innate flexibility and impeccable robustness that comes straight out of the box. So it's no wonder that Postgres has earned its reputation as the ultimate rock solid database. So as this t-shirt shows, you know. So, so let's see why. So going back in 2001, Postgres introduced crash recovery using right ahead logging. Uh, that marked a significant step in uh, data durability. You probably remember you know, the LAMP stack at the time, Postgres and MySQL were emerging, and at the time Postgres was worrying about this stuff, not losing data more than performance. And that's what made MySQL more popular at the time. Okay, but again, uh, I don't know if you know, a recent Stack Overflow survey revealed that actually now Postgres is the most popular database in the world. Okay. So in 2005, the introduction of continuous backup 
and point in time recovery fortified Postgres through online physical based backups and wall archiving, enabling effective uh, disaster recovery. These pioneering features are the focal point of today's presentation. Over the next decade, Postgres expanded its continuous backup infrastructure to include advanced, the advanced replication system that we witness today, and primarily serving the high availability needs uh, of an organization. So it's important to note that this uh, presentation doesn't cover PGDump, as PGDump only generates SQL level snapshots of the database, and these are not suitable for business continuity. So instead, we focus on continuous backup. So before looking into Postgres backup and recovery infrastructure, let's grasp uh, some fundamental concepts. Postgres writes uh, data in eight kilobyte pages inside a directory called pgdata, while transactions are stored in write-ahead log files that are also known as pgwall. Shared buffers uh, serve as a cache for better performance, and each connection with a client is managed by a dedicated process known as Postgres backend. When a Postgres backend uh, requests a page from disk, the page is first loaded in the shared buffers and then returned to the uh, backend. And when a backend changes the content of a page in memory, that change is first saved in the right ahead log, not the data files. So as you can see, the shared buffers, you know, have the content there, okay? The information is written in the wall segment. This is the reason why this is called write ahead log, or simply wall. So for better data durability, Postgres allows you to archive each wall file in another location. And this is normally referred to as the wall archive. Postgres works on the assumption that shared buffers and data files might differ at any time. It's the checkpoint process that ensures that dirty pages are regularly flushed to disk. So in brief, to ensure smooth disaster recovery, we need to focus on safeguarding PG database backups and the wall archive. These resources are essential for point in time recovery and at the same time serve as the bedrock for Postgres replication. So let's examine now the mechanics of continuous backup. With an active Postgres uh, server and, and its PG data, the current wall file is consistently archived in a separate storage location, such as, for example, uh, an object store. Files inside the PG data need to be physically copied. These copies are called base backups, and Postgres provides an API for taking them online without stopping the database. These are called hot physical backups. The procedure is quite simple. You invoke the Postgres uh, API to start a backup. It's called PG Start Backup or PG Backup Start, the start now, and begin copying all the files inside uh, the PG data. This process could take a few minutes, a few hours, a few days. It depends on the size of your database. And in the meantime, those files might change. And, uh, but this is not a problem because, as I said before, Postgres expects that all changes are stored in the write-ahead log first. And they are saved in the wall archive. So by saving the wall archive and the base backups, we're fine. So concluding the backup involves uh, signaling the end of the copy process through the Postgres API and awaiting for the final wall file to be archived uh, safely. For a backup to be uh, consistently restored, you need all the wall files from the start uh, of the backup till the end of the backup. 
Um, pictures this now, you know, you've got your database in, in production, as time marches on, your database churns out world files, recycles them, and dutifully archives them. So your task is as simple as scheduling backups, uh, whether daily or, or weekly, it's really up to you. And if you do this, you basically have continuous backup in Postgres. So notably, Postgres does not require a specific implementation for copying these files. And this is very important for us, you know, because with our operator, we're now using volume snapshots. Okay, this is a generic implementation. So please follow me now as this, this is very important, okay? Provided you have a catalog of base backups and a continuous sequence of world files in the archive, Postgres allows you to recover to any point in time from the end of the first base backup that you have to the latest committed transaction that is contained in the last archived world file. In the, okay? So this is simple. Okay, simple and clear. So you suppose you have a disaster now and you need to recover to the point before the disaster. You basically copy the, the latest available base backup in the server where you want to restore Postgres. And then, for example, you configure Postgres to recover up to the latest available transaction in the wall archive. Postgres uh, starts fetching all the wall files from, from the first wall required by the uh, base backup and applies the committed, committed transactions until it reaches the recovery target, which is in our, in our case, the end of the wall, okay? Then it promotes itself, becoming ready to serve your applications. And this feature is important to note, I just provide an example to restore until the end, okay? This is the case of full disaster, but suppose you, you delete uh, a table or you put a wrong where query in your SQL statement, uh, you can go back to any point in time, okay? So as demonstrated earlier, Postgres is fully equipped to meet your business continuity needs. All you require is to set up um, uh, three things. Regular base backups, configuration of uh, continuous wall archiving, distribution of backups and wall files across multiple locations for enhanced global RPO and RTO goals. If you adopt these practices, you gain the ability to recover your system at any given uh, moment. And this is a proven uh, strategy that already many organizations have embraced in the last decade and, and, and more outside Kubernetes. But this is KubeCon, this is 2023, so let's delve into how the cloud native PG operator with no, with no effort integrates all of these and conceals uh, the underlying complexity uh, for you. So cloud native PG is actually more than, a, more than an operator. So it aligns perfectly with uh, the principles outlined by uh, Jeff Carpenter and Patrick McFadden in, the, in this book. It harnesses the Kubernetes API, operates declaratively, prioritizes observability, and comes with built-in security. This robust solution includes a production-ready operator for all supported Kubernetes versions and a suite of operand images uh, for Postgres. Cloud PG sets apart from other Postgres operators as it directly um, extends Kubernetes to manage the entire life cycle of a Postgres database, encompassing essential day two operations such as automated failover or backup and recovery. In contrast to other approaches, it forgoes the use of stateful sets, opting to manage uh, persistent volume claims directly. Cloud-native PG was initiated by my company, EDB, and now is an open source project that is managed uh, by an openly governed and vendor neutral community. As maintainers, we're committed 
to uh, seeking inclusion in the CNCF uh, sandbox. And uh, if you want to know more, you can scan this, scan this QR code and get to the project, download it, test it, and read the documentation. But let's now examine what Cloud Native PG provides in terms of disaster recovery. Cloud Native PG stores wall archive in an object store, and out of the box, wall files are archived maximum every five minutes. This is your worst case scenario for RPO. Physical based backups can be taken instead in two ways, using object stores or on volume snapshots using the new uh, support for the standard Kubernetes API. And when dealing with large databases, volume snapshots emerge as the preferred choice for streamlined backup and recovery. Here's a quick comparison table outlining the backup and recovery methods between the object store and volume snapshot approaches. A crucial point to consider is the copy and write optimization offered by the storage, enabling you to leverage incremental and differential backup and recovery at, at block, uh, block level. These functionalities prove to be essential Again, especially when dealing with large-scale databases. And this is probably one of the most important slides. Today's presentation is a summary of the benchmark results I ran on, EK, on an EKS cluster. So to ensure consistency, the test was focused on base backup recovery without wall recovery. I conducted uh, some tests across various database sizes, ranging from four gigabytes to over four terabyte databases with consistent outcomes. Notably, volume snapshots systematically outperformed object stores in both backup and recovery operations. So consider the 4.4 terabyte uh, scenario backup speed showcased a 25 fold improvement compared to object stores. More importantly, recovery time demonstrated a 300 fold improvement over object stores. Again, underscoring uh, the remarkable advantages that the standard API that Kubernetes provides for volume snapshot um, brings to, to the game. So now, back to Michelle. All right, thank you. So let's explore what's happening uh, under the hood. Um, oh, sorry, with cloud native PG backups. Um, so, Cloud Native PG is leveraging the Kubernetes volume snapshots feature. Um, this feature went GA in Kubernetes 120, and it provides a standard and portable API across um, storage providers through CSI drivers. And today, we have over 100 different CSI drivers available, um, supported by all the major cloud providers and on-prem storage vendors. And so, the Kubernetes uh, Volume Snapshots API lets you do three basic operations. First, create a snapshot of a persistent volume claim, delete that snapshot, and then also create a new persistent volume claim from the snapshot. And just taking a look at the Kubernetes API in a little more detail, we can see that the API here follows a similar pattern to persistent volume claims in Kubernetes. So as a user, you will create a volume snapshot object and you specify the persistent volume claim you want to um, take that snapshot of. Um, you can also specify custom parameters and configuration for those snapshots with a uh, snapshot volume snapshot class. And then from there, Kubernetes will then invoke the CSI drivers to actually go take the snapshots in the, in the underlying storage system. And then, when you actually want to restore your workload um, with a new disk, what you would do is create a new persistent volume claim object where you specify um, as a data source that volume snapshot. And now Kubernetes will go and will create a new volume and rehydrate that data from that snapshot. So that's, that's kind of what's happening um, you know, at the Kubernetes level of things. But we can um, see here how the Cloud Native PG API can simplify that experience. So um, 
here's the cloud native PG uh, cluster specification. And we can see here, um, in order to configure volume snapshots backup, all you have to do is go to the backup se session and then um, just specify the volume snapshot class that you want to use for taking them. And then also, if you want to also um, do the wall archive backups, then you also configure an object store uh, for the barman object store backup policy. So once you configure that, then the next step is you can take snap or you can take backups in one of two ways. Um, one way is you can create the scheduled backup object um, where you can specify a schedule. Um, this example here is showing taking a backup once a day. Um, you specify your cloud native PG cluster you want to take that back above, and the method you choose will be volume snapshots. Um, you can also take a snap uh, backup on demand by using the cloud native PG kubectl uh, command, um, and where you just give the um, you just you just give the cluster that you want to take a backup of and the method, which is also volume snapshots. And now, in a disaster recovery scenario, if you need to restore that Postgres cluster, what you'll do here is create a new cloud native PG cluster object. And under the bootstrap and recovery se uh, section, that is where you specify the volume snapshots that you want to restore this cluster from. And here you pa directly pass in the names of the Kubernetes volume snapshot objects you want to use. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, see this in action with a demo. How do we? Cool. So our demo cluster, we're going to demonstrate this on um, a GKE cluster. And I'll probably have to look here to see what's going on. OK, we're going to start with a three node uh, Postgres cluster. And we can see here, um, you'll, in the cluster spec, we'll specify the storage classes we want to use for the volumes. And then under the backup section, we're specifying the volume snapshot class um, that we want to use for our backup method. And we can also then um, just check which volume snapshot classes we have in our cluster. Um, here, we're just using a default volume snapshot class using persistent disks. And then um, you can see on the top, we have the scheduled backup objects where we're saying take a backup once a day. All right, and so now we can actually, um, let's also look at the, the Postgres cluster that's currently running. Um, we'll see the name here. We can see the number of instances. Um, and then when we uh, go down, we can see a couple of conditions about the cluster. We can see that the cluster is healthy, um, continuous archiving is working, and we can see when the last backup was successful or failed. Um, going down a little bit more, we can see some more details. Like we can see which pod is currently the primary. We can see all the persistent volume claims that um, this cluster is using, and we can also see all the other pods that are part of this cluster. And then we'll also see what backups we have currently taken. And so we can see we took, our last backup was taken about six minutes ago. And we can also find the corresponding Kubernetes volume snapshots that were taken as part of that. And you can see here there's two snapshots, one for the main um, data volumes and another for the wall. And then um, now we're going to log in to the database to just inspect some of the tables that are available. Um, this database was populated with data using PG Bench. Um, we'll see here that this is a 22 gigabyte database. And um, we can see this has about 150 million rows of data. OK. So now we're going to simulate a disaster. We're just going to go and delete the cluster. Whoops. <laughs> My bad. All 
Okay, and so now um, we'll see the pods. There's no more pods left besides our, our client pod. And then um, we can see all the disks are gone, but we can see we still have our snapshots. Um, and so now we want to restore this cluster. So let's take note of those two snapshots, the last two snapshots that we want to use. Um, we're going to start a watch on the uh, cloud native PG cluster object. And then we're going to kick off this script, um, which will basically start creating the new restored cluster. Um, we can see that now um, we're starting to bring up the primary. And let's go ahead and inspect the new cluster spec here. Um, here, we're going to first restore the primary. And so here you can see the instance is, is one, but after this is done, we can end up scaling it out to the remaining replicas. And the most important part here is in this bootstrap section. Here we are specifying the, the two um, latest volume snapshots in the cluster. We have one for the uh, volume, uh, for, sorry, for the data volume and one for the uh, wall storage. And so it takes about a minute, and after a minute, um, the pod is able to come up. And um, now we're able to, uh, we're just waiting for it to kind of become leader. And there we go. Now the cluster is healthy. Mm, yep. And then we're going to just inspect a couple of the objects. We see now some new persistent volume claims have been created. And if we take a look at those in a little more detail, We can see, when we inspect this persistent volume claim, we can see the data source um, is specified as the volume snapshot. And so this volume was created with data populated from that snapshot. All right, and then now we're gonna go back, um, log back into the cluster and inspect the database contents. We'll check the size again, it's still 22 gigs. And then we'll check the number of rows in the table. It should be 150 million. All right. Sorry, we need to restore our slides. Yeah, I'm good with databases, but not with this stuff, so. <laughs> okay, yeah, so um, now that we've seen, no, I'm good. Now that we've seen um, sort of an example of how it works today, um, I'd like to just talk about some of the future enhancements that uh, we're continuing to look into in both the Kubernetes space and the cloud-native PG space. So first in Kubernetes, um, we are developing this new volume group snapshots feature, which will um, definitely help Cloud Native PG um, be able to take uh, volume snapshot backups more efficiently because you can do things like partitioning your data and optimizing for different storage uh, efficiencies, and, and then also allow taking those volume snapshots in parallel. Um, another enhancement we're working on in, in SIG storage is the container object storage interface. Um, this is very similar to the concept of CSI, but it's tailored for object storage and it's trying to standardize the control plane operations for managing object storage buckets. Um, this is also, this would be very useful for cloud native PG as well. Um, as you can see, um, it, it uses object storage, it manages object storage to do the uh, wall archiving. And then, um, I don't know if do you yeah, want to talk for about... For Cloud Native PG, we're actually working on version 122, 
which will be released by the end of the year, which will support table spaces. So table spaces are a vertical scalability feature that will enable to improve this, you know, management of very large databases even further. And we just started, basically. We're just scraping the surface at the moment of what the volume snapshot that the CSI drivers are actually able to offer to us. The next step will be PVC cloning. So basically, imagine this. You can scale up just by cloning volumes uh, instead of running PG-based backups. And this will also be used for in-place upgrades. Okay, so uh, key takeaways, you know, we've got a full open source stack now to run Postgres in Kubernetes, okay? Uh, you've got Kubernetes APG, PostgreSQL, and Kubernetes, so you can really mitigate the risk of vendor lock-in. And uh, the main benefit of using volume snapshots is to have, in general, better RPO and RTO goals, which, again, are the business continuity uh, goals that we need to achieve, okay? And uh, they are suitable for all major cloud service providers, but they're also available on on-premise. Okay, on-premise. So our advice is to check what your storage classes provide and uh, do your benchmarks, you know, do your tests, and if you can, use volume snapshots. The other good thing is that you can actually also mix backup strategies. You can have, have a hybrid strategies with object stores and volume snapshots. In your, in, your, in your system. So uh, volume snapshot basically uh, open a new year, era for, for uh, Postgres in Kubernetes because th thanks to incremental and differential backup and recovery, you know, we can manage very large databases as you saw in the previous slide. And this is just a recommended uh, reading for you. I wrote this blog article a month ago. Uh, that gives you an idea of, about our view um, in terms of architecture for Postgres in Kubernetes. And uh, there's also this other blog article that pretty much recaps uh, the things we have, the benchmarks that I ran as part of this presentation. So you'll find these in the slides for later usage. So any questions? Okay. Um, my question is, how would you, or can you make this multi-region hot, hot, or is this limited to like I know, warm? I know. Yeah, yeah. So basically, this is uh, the good thing about this system. And if you, if you read the blog article about the architecture, you'll find a lot of information on the multi-region stuff. But essentially, by using volume snapshots, we delegate data mobility to the storage class. So as long as the volume snapshot is available in the other region, that's fine. Okay, we can recover. Thank you. I guess there's lunch. That's why everyone's leaving. Uh, hello. Uh, we currently do use the operator from Zalando. And maybe I just wanted to ask you what, uh, what does differentiate you from okay. them? What's, uh, what's better? Because I think that you have started quite recently. Okay, that's not really, okay. So the question is, what, primarily, what's the main difference between the Zalando operator and our operator? So the Zalando operator is actually the second uh, Postgres operator ever written. And uh, uh, we are from Italy, we know Zalando people a lot. We, and we, that's actually the first time I saw Postgres in Kubernetes. Uh -huh. We took a completely different approach with the operator uh, we actually tried, tried to, bro to bring Postgres in Kubernetes. And for example, we didn't use Patroni. We didn't use Barman or PGVacrest. So we didn't use the tools available in Postgres, but we actually did, decided to leverage what's in Kubernetes. So um, that's why I say it's more than an operator, because it's actually also a failover management system. Uh, it, it, it provides... Um, Tabs for observability, backup and recovery, as you see now. And I said, this is just the start. So it's fundamentally a completely different approach that we took. We waited. We started four years ago, actually. We released it open source a year and a half ago. And uh, we waited for local persistent volumes. 
to, to be basically ready. That's, if you read again this story, you see that we actually, before starting this project, we benchmarked running Postgres on bare metal. We didn't find any difference because that's the way we used to do it. Okay, we were, we've been managing some of the largest Postgres databases for years in the world. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that it could work on bare metal as well, and it does. Okay, and volume snapshots are also available on bare metal installations. So it's essentially a completely different approach. We don't use stateful sets. We use persistent volume claims. That's why I think we're able to do this stuff as well. It helps us for rolling up, up upgrades, um, pod disruption budget control, all this kind of stuff, you know. So have a look and, and you know, join the community. And if you've got Thank more you very questions. Much. This is very impressive. Thank, Thank you. you. I would, I would like to thank Leonardo. Leonardo, please stand up. Today is his, it's his birthday. Leonardo is a maintainer of Cloud Native PG. And any other questions? Yeah. So uh, thanks. This is amazing work. Uh, just had two questions. One, uh, can volume snapshots be taken uh, off cluster and restored to a different cluster as well? And the second one was uh, regarding the cloud native PG operator. Like, it's, it's sometimes useful to see a list of backups, right? Like, uh, if you if you've taken hundreds of backups in a long running cluster, uh, is there a way to do that with yeah. the operator? I'll reply to the second. Maybe if you want to reply to the first. Uh, uh, yeah. Sorry. What was the first question? The, if you can move it. Ah, oh, sorry. So the first question is: uh, Is it possible to move the volume snapshots to a different cluster and restore it on a different like? Like, yeah, let's yes. say you take it on uh, one cluster and move it on to a different cluster. Yes. Um, uh, you'll need to double check the uh, actual storage capabilities, but okay. for the most part, when um, the objects in Kubernetes are just references to the snapshots in the underlying storage system, so you should just be able to take those snapshot objects and just import them into another cluster. Okay. Yeah. And for the backups, you can actually get the list of backups. And uh, uh, we put a lot of labels in the backup objects by default. So you are able to, for example, uh, see what backups belong to a cluster, the date they were taken, uh, all these. We've got several labels and annotations, OK, okay. In, so in, each, in both the volume snapshots and the backups. For example, it's important for the volume snapshots that we also store as, as, as an annotation the, conf, the, the spec of the cluster. So uh, the spec of the cluster is stored in the, in the volume snapshot. So you only need that to restore everything. Okay? That's why this also integrates with Kubernetes level backup tools okay, very well. Makes sense. Okay. Thanks. Another question? Yeah. Cloud Native PG, advantage is over. But uh, uh, OK, so essentially, Cloud Native PG, it's Postgres. OK, then all the benchmarks, basically, our exercise has been to bring Postgres in Kubernetes. OK, so and now we can say, in my opinion, I will never go back to VMs or bare metal to, 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 to run Postgres. Okay? To me, this is the best way to run Postgres that we have. Okay? And essentially, the same things that we were applying on bare metal and VMs, now you apply them on Kubernetes. You need Kubernetes skills. And you know, it, to reach the TPS, you know, transaction per second, it's really an exercise of uh, customizing Postgres to your organization, which is different from any other organization in the world, and run benchmarks. Okay, but this is Postgres. I mean, the test that I showed before, I was able to run to achieve 1,100 transactions per second on the 4.5 terabyte database using synchronous commit and remote apply. So if you know Postgres, you know what it means. It means that I write a transaction, and not only I wait that the stand, for the standby to store it 
locally. I also wait for the standby to apply and see it. So essentially, you have read consistency between this, the primary and the standby. Okay, these are amazing results. I mean, it, you know, the vertical scalability in Postgres is something that we should not uh, under, underplay, okay? And when we add table spaces and partitioning, I think this is a, another interesting talk maybe for next year or for uh, uh, Paris, you know? I look forward to it. Yeah. scale up and down if there are no stateful sets here so how do you scale up and down we cannot remove random pod right i mean it's all done by the operator the operator treats every instance like any other so there's no primary or you know one that is better than the others okay so it's again like treating like a cattle instead of pets okay we bypass the stateful set concept and we control directly the persistent volumes, okay? Because, I mean, we've, we've written this stuff for Postgres, as you saw, 15 years ago, okay? So we have put all the logic inside Kubernetes where we have more control than before, than ever, actually, because applications that reside where the database is benefit from having a single authority that controls the network and primarily the routing as well. Okay, so that's why, I mean, we've never experienced this split brain with Cloud Native PG. And when you talk about failover management, that's quite impressive. But one thing I suggest that you look at is the amount of end-to-end -end tests that we continuously run in our pipelines and, uh, and uh, yeah, and how we build the operator in general, you know. But yeah, so basically we just control everything. We hibernate the, the cluster, we, we can fence the instances. So even the rolling upgrade, upgrade procedure, we first upgrade the standbys and then we give you the possibility to choose to do the switch, a switch over or a simple restart of the, of the instance and do it automatically or you know, manually, okay? So this is thanks to directly working with, with persistent volumes. All right, any other questions? Cool, thank okay. you everyone. Thank you. Thank you.